our rock star for today is Peter Betts. So Peter is a professor of tectonics at Monash University and he's also the current Geological Society ambassador and speaker. So as part of this role, he's prepared a very thought-provoking talk about rethinking the earth sciences narrative. So I'm really, really excited to hear from you. Thank you so much for coming on today. Thanks everyone for showing up and and uh, and it was it's great. I saw some of the names there and there's some definitely some blasts from the past uh, ex Monash people in in the audience. So hi to everyone. Um, today I'm I well so I'll start off by saying um, this is a presentation that I've kind of been doing um, a national tour with um, and. And that tour has really involved me walking between my kitchen and my bedroom for the last 18, 18 months. And so I've given it live once in, 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 at our University of New South Wales. And this is, the, this is version nine. I change it a little bit every time as I um, think about it. But um, it's actually, uh, it's not a, you know, your typical geoscience talk where we talk about my favourite rocks or my favourite model or something like that. It's actually about um, something that I've been thinking a lot about in the last, well, in the last two years, and it's become um, sharp in my mind, in particular since COVID, and I'll explain why. So I really am going to talk about the way that we are portraying ourselves to the wider world. Um, some people get their noses are really, are really upset with me when I give this talk because they think I'm actually anti-mining, and that's actually not the case at all. I'm actually very pro-mining. Um, this is really about um, how we are seen and perceived by, by um, younger people and, and some of the traps that we fall into, either as an individual or as a group of people. So that's kind of the gist of the talk. Um, I want to start with narratives because um, we all have, a, have a, um, a, a, our own narrative and, and that narrative really dictates the way we see ourselves and our role in, in the world and, and, and they're very powerful because they help us explain that complexity in our lives. And the narrative is our personal narratives, but also um, institutional narratives or, or discipline narratives are very important because they give us our sense of place and purpose. And so when we ask someone to change their narrative, you're actually asking them to do something um, quite um, disruptive in their life. Um, and that's because we're asking them to change their cognition and their emotional patterns. And those things are typically resistant to change. So. Um, these are not my words. That I summarise them there. It's the, um, you can go see them in, in an article in um, in the uh, conversation by Peter Allerton. But it actually, when I read that article, I was like, "Yes, this is this is uh, this is what I'm asking people to do." I'd already started the talk, and what I'm asking is is actually difficult. And of course, our, our experience dictates our narrative. And I'm actually going to talk a little bit about. Um, my my experience um, in, in 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 kind of um, in, in some sort of terminology. I'm not going to tell you my life story. That's that's really boring. But um, but I will uh, talk about that. So experience dictates our narrative. So when everyone in this audience thinks about their own narrative, it is largely driven by what they've experienced in their life. And then if I ask the question, why did you become an earth scientist? Which is which is a, a critical one. Everyone will answer differently. Um, the general trend is. Um, that they fell into it by accident. But the other thing that I've noticed when I give this talk is after the talk, everyone wants, everyone wants to tell me their narrative. So narratives are something that people are passionate about. And so, um, and I'm more than happy to listen to your narrative, but um, uh, what I'm asking you to do is have a think about how, how you communicate that. I, this is my crack at, or my, my attempt at understanding or, or, or making up a narrative for our broader discipline. I'll call it Earth System Sciences or, or Geosciences. And, and it's one that's tried to capture what I think um, capture our importance. So, and then I'm going to use, it, use this to reflect on how I think the rest of the world sees us. So you know, I think um, we are actually a profound discipline um, in, in, the science, in the science spectrum. And, and really important, um, we deal with basically uh, fundamentally um, our, our humanity, so our origins, the world that we live in, the resources that we consume, the hazards that we face, and the environments. And we are actually the stewards of all these things. So geosciences scientists are responsible for understanding these things and providing advice that allows society to thrive in, in these things. And all the challenges that I, I see as big science challenges are actually challenges that 
earth scientists can contribute towards, okay? So we're problem solvers that will create a sustainable future and, and enable that transformation that's required from um, um, an energy regime that's largely reliant on fossil fuels and, and converting that over to um, a, a, a renewable or a, or a, or a carbon-free um, energy system. And that's a massive challenge. Everyone's talking about it at the moment. Um, and I don't want to trivialise that, but actually we're, we are um, a very important cog in that wheel. So let's talk about me for the one slide I promise I will not talk about myself because it's really boring. He's been in slightly larger days and with a guy called Brendan Crawford. He may or may not be in the room. And this is uh, in, in the Yukon Territory in 2007. And by the time I was 37 back then, I kind of knew why I loved earth sciences. It took me a while to not get there because I loved it from the beginning. But, you know, I realised what the elements are that really drove me to get up out of bed every morning and become a geologist. And the first one was um, I, I, I had this passion for the lifestyle. I really love the mixed um, combination of indoors and outdoors. My father was a plumber and he wanted me to be a plumber as well, which would have given me the outdoors. He, unfortunately, I wasn't born with any handyman genes and so I uh, sensibly walked away from that. So I'd love to travel. Most people will say that, right, to get to go and hang out in the Yukon Territory for uh, four weeks and uh, get helicoptered around is a fabulous experience. Um, everyone will have a story like that. From a scientific perspective, I love the forensics of geology. And that is really taking disparate pieces of information and looking at all the clues and piecing together a story. And that's and that would be the one thing about our discipline. I think that that is kind of um, that attracts many of us. And of course, there was a career and a diversity. So I spent all my life in in the academic system, and I've flitted off in the past and done um, consulting on, on the side. So I've, I really like that. And of course, we all generally get paid reasonably well and and usually it's for much to my wife's um, despair when I describe my job as my hobby and she thinks that's madness but but everyone else in the room kind of would know what I'm talking about so that's my that's when I realized what I liked about geology most of the times now in my role at the university I'm the, I'm, I have a title so it's a fancy one so it's called the associate dean of graduate research right it's, it means nothing to anyone except for the dean himself and, and basically that means is I look after the PhD program. And, and what that really means is you're interacting with the, the complexities that involve academics, PhD students, policies and procedures. And when they go, all go pear-shaped, my job is to kind of sort it out. Anyway, so they're complex problems that I deal with every day. I often have to make um, sensible decisions without sparse data, with sparse data, sorry. I have to synthesise data that's often incomplete as well. I'm always dealing with ambiguity and I'm always dealing with people. And I would argue that those skills are the ones that I developed as a geologist that make me pretty good at my job as an Associate Dean of Graduate Research. So these are transferable skills and no one, and no one really talks about that. So I, I believe my training as a geologist has set me up for something that's quite different to geology but has given me a skill set. And then, of course, my perception of man is I noticed Helen in the in the in the in the uh, in the in the audience, and there's her and I in uh, Patagonia. Um, some of my third year students, um, Helen McFarlane in the bottom corner, um, and Brenton and and Mary in in the Yukon with me. And I've kind of got this uh, vision of my life, which looks like that, which is actually not real, because um, I spend you know, four weeks a year in the field and the rest of the time I sit in an office, but that's kind of my perception. The perception is everything and I'm going to argue in this talk that we've got a perception problem and it's starting to play out um, in society, in the university sector, and it will play out in the industry in the near future and it's something that we all have to think about and it starts with our narrative and it will end with... Uh, um, we will have to end with some actions at the end of it. So how does the rest of society um, view it? Well, I have teenage kids. Um, some of them went on to the, uh, the climate action um, protests. Others didn't. Um, I would argue that they're, um, some of them are, are more socially conscious than I was when I was 15 or 16. Um, but I would argue that the young people in particular see 
our discipline as a science of exploitation, extraction, and low technology. It doesn't mean it's real, it's just their perception. There's a poor connection between, um, or there's poor linkage between the need for a, a renewable future and, and mining, and, and somehow this connection needs to be made much more relevant and, and more clearly. I think there's an unspoken uh, dread of science and, and I hear my colleagues and my uh, students get really excited about dangerous things like volcanoes and earthquakes, and I know I do, but actually when you talk about these things to um, lay people, they actually have, uh, have a better, more trepidation around that. I'm going to show some data around that. Um, we are not well aligned with Gen Z and their expectations, and that's where the problem lies, and that's something that we're going to have to deal with because... Um, they're the future. Um, I would argue we've seen this the domain of middle-aged uh, white-bearded guys. Um, I shaved my beard off particularly today for this uh, presentation. And, and, and I've heard people talk about putting profits ahead of the future. I'm not saying I believe that, but it's actually true. And it links to something that has actually come to light in the last region, which is the concept of ethical fading which is when we focus on everything but, is the, but accept the right thing to do. And the example of that would be um, the, the uh, destruction of a sacred site by a mining company. Okay, So within their legal rights to do it, uh, had government permission to do it, but it wasn't the right thing to pass the pub test. And whilst there might have been a tolerance for that in the past from um, um, older generations, there's certainly a no tolerance for that. In, in our young people. So that's something that we need to be mindful of. So why is this important? Um, there's Robin and Kumo. Kumo's just about to finish PhD. Robin's, he's me in the classroom these days. Um, and now I've got, I can't read that now. Um, and I would argue now that geology and geophysics in Australia is on its knees. And it has been for a long time and we've been ignoring it. And COVID-19 is about to, well, is about and is in the process of delivering a knockout punch in many places. Let me give you some examples. Um, University of Melbourne um, Geoscience Department is about to be merged with a giant geography department and the staff that are going will be geologists. Macquarie University has just announced $25 million job cuts and this is on the back of them cancelling essentially their curriculum. University of Newcastle Castle has just closed its geology section and um, at my own institution, Monash, has cut back on the curriculum, although no jobs have been lost at the moment. Um, there's very few departments, and I, I counted three with Sue Fletcher today from the GSA, that have been untouched in COVID. And this is something that's, that we should all be paying lots of attention to. So here's some data that, that's real. So this is the GSA uh, compilation, and what it showed shows is that between there's a peak of enrolments um, in, a, in some sort of a, between 2012 and 2014. And since then, undergraduate taught load has dropped by 33%. Um, and that's pre-COVID data that ends in 2017. And, and, and when people looked at this data, they said two things. They said, I'm just going to um, open up the pointer. Hang on. There's a pointer. They said that peak there, which is the peak of student enrolments, is following the peak of this boom cycle. And essentially, when we made that assessment as a community, we exonerated ourselves from addressing the problem. And that was way back in 2014, 2015. I used to hear things like this. It's part of the boom-bust cycle. Enrolments will pick up, et cetera. And, and actually, in the reality, it hasn't happened. And relating this to the middle exploration um, cycles of Australia, is also a flaw because in the UK, which does is not beholden to that same cycle, the data shows the same amount of fall in student enrolments in geology degrees. And the USA is the same. So in pre-COVID, enrolments were down by 33%. Interestingly, the data out of the USA yesterday that I read on LinkedIn shows that all graduates between 2013 and 2018 80 plus percent of those are employed as geologists. So there's great employment opportunities still in, in, in places like the USA, yet the enrolments are dropping off. Now that could be linked as well. I'm not going to go into that sort of argument, but it's interesting that this is a global phenomenon and not something that's linked to Australia. I think this is a telling graph. 
So this is the trend for the search term um, for geology um, from Ian Stewart on a, on a Twitter uh, uh, um, a tweet that he did a, a while ago, and it shows 2004 peak searches for geology in Google, and it's basically dropped off 80% in that time. Forget about the blue line, that's China, okay? And so what that's saying is people are searching for the term geology using Google significantly less now in 2020 than they were in in 2004. And I think that's a worry because that is actually and largely determined. Now, we again, when I talk to people about this, they, they exonerate themselves, go, oh, yeah, that's geology, but they're doing searches for terms like oceanography and geophysics and stuff like that. We don't really know that. All we can do is look at that data and go, that's problematic. And, in fact, the, the, the steepest part of that gradient was between 2004 and 2008. I'm just going to show um, a snapshot of what uh, what an undergraduate um, geoscience degree looks like in at Monash University this year, just to give you some perception. So year one, we have 400 students do um, a combined earth, atmosphere and environment um, journalist course, and that drops off to about 50 students in, 50 to 70 students in second year. And then by third year, we have about 30. And this year we are producing one honor student in geology. And that one honor student is the person that's going to go out into the industry and become a professional geologist. And that's why I say the university's problems now are going to be the future problem for the mining sector and the, and the exploration sector because that's the future workforce and there's no pipeline into it. And we have an aging um, working population. And I can see um, Martin in the in the in the audience and shaking his head. It's it's actually shocking. And I can remember a time when we had 50 honor students, not too distant future. So this slide here is really talking about um, some of the characteristics that we of young people that we need to be mindful. This is something not something that I've made up um, from my own perceptions. There's actually many studies out there for that. And I'm fortunate in the faculty office, I sit next to opposite someone called Susie Ho who's a uh, Master's in, in, in Environmental Science Coordinator, and she's all over this stuff like a rash. And so when I talk to her about it, I actually sometimes find myself doing a little fact, uh, self-check on, on my own biases in the world. And so what we're really talking about, so I, so I noticed there's some boomers in there, I'm a Gen X, lots of millennials, and, and, and one of our uh, traps that we fall into is we often... Um, we often transfer our own experiences onto the younger generations and, and assume that the way we thought about things is the same. That's a really um, bad trap. Um, you know, for example, I, Gen Xs are notorious for collecting toys. I love them. You know, I'm always collecting things, you know, a jet ski, a, a sports car, whatever. I'm making some of that up because I don't know that either of them. But, um, but those sorts of things they do. But my kids are not that interested in those sorts of things. Um, so here's some characteristics around Generation Z, which are really the people that were born between 1995 and 2015, so some of them are still babies. Um, and, and, but the very first generations of the Gen Z are now moving into the university sector. So when you ask them about what sort of organisations they want to work for, they want to work for an organisation that is socially responsible, is human-centred and ethical. So, and, it need, and they need to have a purpose in that organisation. They want to contribute to improving people's lives. Um, and so, as I said before, they're not really motivated by things like I am. Um, and they're more motivated by purpose. So that's the thing that we need to focus on in, to, in, in order to win their hearts, is we have to give them a sense of purpose around their career choices. Okay, and there's other emphasis on mental, work, work, mental health and well-being. But we need to do that because that was very different to the way I looked at the world when I was um, the equivalent age to a Gen Z. In fact, I was coming off the back of a, of a couple of recessions and I uh, was just happy to have a job and an income. And it's a very different mindset to, to um, that of today. Someone pointed out to me yesterday that, this year will be the first year that we see in universities the students that went on to the, who did the uh, global climate strike protests. And if we don't think these, are, these kids are a force to reckon with, we're talking about 300,000 people who just walked off, the, off, the, off their schools and went out and, and voiced their concerns. 
and, and we have to listen to that because they're now in, in universities, okay? In our city, 100,000, I was in the city that day. I was uh, shocked how many people were walking around. I've not seen anything like that in my, in my lifetime. So now I want to talk about why there's this disconnect between what young people, why young people are essentially walking away and, and are from geoscience, why I think it is. Now it's a working hypothesis and we really do need to collect data and I'll put that out there. Um, but I think it's partially about the way that geoscientists in general communicate. And, and and I'm going to talk a little bit about the individual first, and then I'm going to talk about how we collectively communicate. Um, and, they're, and they're pretty much the same, to be honest with you. So we make lots of mistakes. And so, and I would argue that the way we communicate is quite transactional. So we like to focus on telling people things about what we do. My name's Pete Betts. I'm a geologist. Nice to meet you in, in the pub. What do you do? I'm, I, I interpret aeromagnetic data to the nth degree and I like processing the data and ta 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 ta, ta. And instantly, if, if I'm talking to another geologist, they're falling into a sleep. If I'm talking to someone who's not interested in geology, they're falling asleep one second into that conversation because no one cares that I interpret geophysics. They just don't. But we insist on you know, talking about everything that we do in the nth degree and what's missing from that conversation is why I do that. What are the social challenges? Why is it important to that person who's listening? And that's a very different conversation. I use uh, cancer research is a classic, right? So you talk to a PhD student working in a biomedical lab who's working on some pissy little protein, you know, mapping it out, doing something to it. And you go, what are you doing? You go, finding a cure for cancer. And you go, really? Tell me more about that. That's interesting, right? And then they might drop you into the enzyme conversation, but, but they've, got, they've captured you. And we don't do that. We do the opposite. We push them away with information that they don't care about at the start of it. And, and I know every geologist does it, everyone. It's this real transactional way, the way we speak to each other, and then we, we, we just proliferate that out to the society. Mistake number two, we're alarmists. Okay, so I know when I walk down the street at Burke Street and, I, and there's this religious group coming my way and they're telling me the end of the world's coming, do I want to walk up to them and say, tell me more about what you're, what you're talking about? I do the opposite. I do a U-bolt and I walk as far, faster than they are away from them. And I suspect when we do the alarmist stuff, which, which happens in climate change but also happens in, 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 in um, exploration, and mining, it's the same thing. Did you know we're going to run out of X metal in 35 years? That conversation happens like we try to engage it with a problem, but actually we're causing alarm. Same with climate change. People, when they feel alarmed, don't want to engage with it because you're taking them out of their comfort zone. Okay, so that's, a, that's another one. Yeah, and, and part of that alarmism is getting excited about dangerous things that no one else gets excited about except for geologists. And so this is in a paper by uh, Stuart and Lewis in Earth Science Reviews. Absolutely, it's absolutely worth having a read. And they cover off some of these topics that I'm talking about really well. But I've just highlighted the things that um, are kind of related to earth sciences in, in some way or another in that paper. And guess what? They're all in the high dread zone. Some things they know about, other things they don't know about, but that's where they sit now. Things that weren't covered off in that, earthquakes, volcanoes, landslides, mining, carbon sequestration, fracking, uranium, coal, hydrocarbons. All those words are fearful words to people who aren't geologists. They don't understand it. They've already got an opinion about it. And so they're not really engaging with it and they're not getting excited like, like I am. So I've been on White Island. It is awesome. Okay. But if I told my mum I was on White Island, she'd freak out. She's a hairdresser, okay, because she sees that picture in front, of, in front of there and goes, that looks really dangerous. And it is really dangerous when it's, when it's erupting, okay. But when I was there, it was kind of really cool funerals and um, sulphide precipitation on the surface and stank. It was, you know, I loved it. It was awesome. Anyway, but I'm a geologist. So I'm being, um, I've been um, conditioned to like those sorts of things. 
So how do we re-image geology as an individual? So when you go to the pub and someone asks you what you do and you and you have the urge to tell them that you like certain types of minerals, don't do it. Okay. Explain why you do ge geosciences first. Tell them about how exciting your life is. Not what you actually do, not your tasks. Focus on your purpose. Have a narrative of positive change. Did you know that we can fix things up if we do these things? People are interested in that positivity. Talk about how geology is part, once you engage with them and they're interested, talk about how geology and mining is part of the solution and not the problem. You've engaged with them, they're interested, then you can start talking about these things. Talk about the challenges of the future and how we address them. Please avoid the details and avoid your own details as well. You know, all my friends who are geologists still talk about, the, about themselves in what they do every, on a day-to-day, hour-to-hour basis. The last one, which really gripes me, and, and, and we've got to get rid of this as a community, right? It's like every time we speak to someone, we tell them how grateful they should be that geology exists in the mining sector, okay? You should be grateful that we are providing 21% of the nation's GDP. No one else does this except for our discipline, okay? I don't walk into shops and um, some retail person says to me, you should be grateful for retail because we provide 23% of the national GDP. No one does that. We do it. It's needy, it's desperate, and no one cares. We've got to put this one away because they just go, they make an association, they go, mining, bad, greed. That's the connection that people make in this, in this moment. Okay, so don't do this one. This is the one you definitely can't do. And we do it all the time. And I went to the OzIMM conference and people will just keep trotting out the same data to me. It's like, why are we talking about this? No one else does. Let's talk about the way we communicate in general. Okay, so I want you to read some of the text on this slide, right? It's really, really interesting. This is an environmental um, website for environmental scientists about a career. So this is a type of website that a mum and dad and a 15 or 16 year old person might read if they're trying to make some choices around what subjects to select when they're doing high school so they can go into university. Careers in environmental science are so varied it's difficult to consider them in one category. You could end up working from home most of the time or traveling the traveling around the world on an annual basis. Really interesting, right? Very vague description of what it is. It doesn't tell you what you're going to do. It tells you what your life will be like. Let's have a look at the Australian um, federal government's uh, jobs uh, website that shows you about geology and geophysics. Geologists, geophysicists, and hydrogeologists study the composition. They locate and advise, they detect, they monitor. Oh, and here's a list of tasks of which when you read them, they're really boring, okay? So again, it's this transactional nature, of, nature about the way we communicate. We're telling someone about everything they're going to do. And as a geologist who loves it, I look at that and go, I don't want to be a geologist. So how does a 15 or 16 year old and their mum and dad look at this and go, oh yeah, that makes me want to become a geologist. You just told me a task. And we know that they're not interested in the pay because they wanted a, a, more, a stronger purpose. So it's really fundamentally different. It's the difference between these two photos. Here I am doing a task with Brad Crow, one of my honor students. Here I am in a really spectacular place on the planet. One of them's telling you what my life will look like and the other one's telling you kind of what I'm doing. And I know which one where I'd rather be in those two photos. We have to be super careful about that when we communicate that. We have to change the way we sell ourselves and task-oriented descriptions are definitely not the way to engage with 15 and 16 year olds. We kind of do it when we talk about this. I'm going to pick on badge pants pretty unfair because actually of the companies that have put themselves out in, in the marketplace in terms of uh, uh, um, visuals lately, they're, 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 they're it. But there's two parts of this Think Big Mining campaign. One finishes with this enormous hole in the ground. <laughs> and the other one focuses on um, wind farms. And I don't know whether they got feedback from the first round to the second round, but, you know, the first one says, you know, what we do is, you know, the message is what we do. We do mining, right? And it's not real. It was, could have been the world's biggest free hit for geology and it ended up probably being 
the opposite effect. But the second one, um, although not perfect, at least focuses on why they mine, which is, you know, the copper that's required to do make wind farms, etc. And this goes to, uh, you know, a point that we actually, as a broader community, need to, to deal with, and that is we need to start to address matters of concern and listening to the things that people are worried about and trying to address them rather than addressing everything in those transactional thing, ways we communicate, which is the way, which is around facts. And I'm, a, I'm as bad as anyone. Look, I'm not saying um, follow my lead. I'm a, I'm, I love arguing facts, but actually what it requires is for us to be better listeners and acting upon what we're hearing rather than being positional and making the argument. I will also argue that, um, and, I, and I'm going to steal this from Steve Hill from his brilliant talk at the AESC last week, um, is that showing the mine is this is the which is what we do in almost every post that I see on LinkedIn, etc. Is the same as a farmer showing the abattoir. It just doesn't do it. The agricultural industry doesn't show the abattoir. It shows at the end of the journey of that produce a family sitting around a table enjoying each other's company. It's amazing the difference that those those images have on different people. So we need to be super careful about this and the way we do it. I'm not going to talk about this. Everyone does this slide in one form or another, but there's some really low-lying fruit. This is one of them. Okay, if we want the future that is being portrayed by most young people, it's going to require more mining than there has ever been before, and we absolutely need to be able to communicate that super clearly. Okay, so that's the first one. And the other one, which I think is also a no-brainer, is that there's 17 United Nations um, global goals of um, sustainable development um, that are supposed to be achieved by 2030. Um, and the ones that you can see are the ones that are directly linked to mining. Okay? So you ask China how they've taken 80% uh, of their population from poverty to 60% um, to being in the middle class. It's through building infrastructure, okay? Investment in infrastructure and energy actually makes poor people less poor, okay? And the other ones are less, uh, are more, more, um, are more obvious in, the, in, that, in that. And, of course, the climate action one links to the one, that pres uh, the, the previous slide. But there are ways we can communicate this in, 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 in the context of, thing, of, uh, of topics that people care about. We should do this. Okay, I'm nearly done, guys. So um, I just want to talk about this because this is um, something that I had been thinking quite deeply about when we were um, when we were, when I was at the conference that guys on in last year um, about mining and education. And um, and what what I learned was that there was a significant HR challenge just, um, faced by mining companies. That was that was the kind of the first starting point of that conference. Um, and, and the people who were speaking weren't geologists, they were HR directors of big mining organisations and they were saying things like, we're really worried about the ageing workforce um, and so we think graduate numbers are, are going to be problematic, so they've already recognised this. Um, and we're quite uncertain about the future of what our workforce would look like and the skills that they would need, but they did provide some hints around data science and and being uh, capable digitally and all those sorts of things. So, so I'm going to park that for a while and I'm going to talk, and, and this talk has really been around the narrative of young people and so our narrative and how it's not meeting the expectations of young people and how it's caused the problem. Um, so it's a cause and, and, and the university environment, which is where I live, is stuck in the middle of these two um, tensions, okay? So even within the university, we have two big issues. You know, sit around in a, you sit around in a, in a departmental meeting, and there's one group of academics who think that universities are for for research and for um, generally general science training, and there's another group who think that um, there should be a stronger alignment with the training with uh, the vocational aspects. And geoscience in general is is really stuck in the middle of of, of that sort of philosophy. Some disciplines it's obviously just general training, and other disciplines like engineering, it's training for a, uh, a career, but, in, but geoscience really does sit in the middle of this round. And so there's a tension inside 
our discipline around what that is. And then the COVID, um, so what, what's happened in the last few years in, in geosciences is, as I pointed out, the numbers have been declining and international students have basically been cross-subsidising research and, and low student numbers in areas that, um, could, uh, that might have been seen as important. And now that, um, that in, income has sort of dried up in, in the universities and now people like uh, DVC Educations are just looking at the system with a sledgehammer and going, oh, that course doesn't have 15 in it, cut it. That's how they operate. And so the, the courses that are most vulnerable are the low enrolment courses and that puts geology in the crosshairs of every DVCE in the country or but maybe two, two universities. Okay, and then, then decisions get made and they become preservation decisions, not decisions that are in the national benefit. It's like, what can we do to the curriculum to save geology? Can we merge these courses? Do we merge this school with a broader school and protect the, have some protectionism or do we just shut it down? They're the kind of decisions. And so we're sitting in that crisis moment at the, in, in the university at the moment, but that's going to flow on into the into the um, into the mining sector and the energy sector and government agencies really quick because those low student numbers are not going to be able to feed the future employment requirements of of the mining sector for example and that's that's a problem and of course in my mind the root cause is our reputation with young people who are pretty much making decisions not to do geology even if they like it at the point that's the feedback I get. So there does need to be a uh, second last slide. National plan. So the blue stuff is the stuff I've been talking about. It's the narrative. It's about changing the way we talk about ourselves to give us purpose. And then there's the actions that are required to, to both. So, so the narrative is the long-term game. There's a national coordination piece of work that has to happen, and that really does involve um, a sector of the of the academic and the and the um, industry community, and uh, and that includes understanding really why it is. So there's lots of people running around with their theories, including I put my hand up and say, including myself. But we really have to get to the bottom of this, and if we don't, then we will die. That's that's the reality, um, and that's that will be that's going to be a hard pill to swallow for nearly everyone in the room, I'd imagine. Okay. Um, at the same time, the, the, the broader industries need to understand or need to communicate what they think they need into the future so that the universities can react. And that's, a, that's an important piece. And universities are going to have to listen, in my mind. And, and, the, and the green stuff is around um, the short to medium term um, interventions that are required. And I actually think is we're really talking about advocacy to get government from um, um, groups such as the MCA and the Melbourne Mining Club, et cetera, to, to let um, government know that this is an issue and it's going to have its problems at, 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 at some point, probably closer to the near future than in the distant future. And, and there's going to have to be an injection of funds to save things. Geophysics is on its knees, taught in four universities, only taught as a major in one university now. Okay, we don't need thousands of geophysicists, but we need some. Okay, that's that's the reality. We've got a diversity problem in our in our in our disciplines. Um, I think everyone is happy to put their hand up and say yes, that's a problem. Um, that has to be addressed. COVID has not helped. So lots of females have lost their jobs in in STEM during COVID because they've been on short term contracts, and they're the ones that um, the HR groups can go. They're easy to get rid of. The continuing professor is a hard hard person. To get rid of so they they go down the easy easy pathway we're going to have to look at programs um, of training that um, cover us off in the short term but also in the long term and that might mean that we need to think about different education models um, to deliver that and so i'm not going to talk about that that's a whole another uh, half an hour talk or longer but these are the sorts of things that we need to talk about okay this psychology to finish when information is complex People like to make decisions based on their values and beliefs. They throw data out the window. Even the best of our scientists do this. Okay? And when they make that decision around their value and belief, 
they go to people who they trust to validate those beliefs, okay? And so these are very important psychological behaviours. Now, think of a 17 or 18-year-old who's going to choose what they're going to study and their career options going forward. This is probably the most complicated question that they've ever had to face. And where are they going to land with that? They're going to make those, those decisions based on their value sets and their beliefs. And those decisions will be influenced by those that they trust. Okay, so we need to think about those elements when we talk about how we're going to change our narrative. Okay, so if we want to rise that, we do have to reinvent the way we talk. So we focus on the trust and values of younger people. And that is the thing that we fundamentally have to do. And if we ignore it or say that this is nonsense, then we are, we, we are, we are in a perilous position as a, as a discipline. And as someone who loves geology more than nearly everything, this is a pretty uh, untangible position that we find ourselves in. So we had a comedy, comedian at the start. I've, I've painted a picture of doom and gloom, but it's not all bad because we actually have one of the best products that we can change and, cha and, 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 and change our narrative to. There's so much we can do with the earth and geology in terms of the way we speak about it. We just have to be recognised that the way we speak about it has to shift and it's actually not that big a deal, bigger ask except for we have to commit to it and we have to sing from the same songbook is, is the other thing. So I'm going to stop there and thanks for um, listening. I do want to acknowledge the GSA. They, uh, they've had me running around as the ambassador. When I gave this first talk the first time, um, the executive almost freaked out on, on them. They were like, you can't talk about this ever again. I went, no, 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 you don't understand. If we don't get this right, and I'm not saying I'm right, you don't have this conversation, you don't have any membership in 20 years' time. And they went, oh, yeah. Okay, so it's super important that we have this conversation and it's super important that we look in the mirror and we try to do things differently. Thanks very much.